Great. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for grant writing, fund development for sustaining high quality programs. This is the launch uh, webinar of our sustainability series. Uh, I'm Allie Leidy. I'm with the New York State Network for Youth Success, and I'm very pleased to have you all here today. I uh, wanted to give you a quick overview of our sustainability series. Uh, we will be offering monthly webinars throughout the rest of the school year. We'll also have an opportunity for in-person uh, sessions at our annual conference coming up uh, in Troy at the end of March. Uh, and we'll be sending out information on this to all of you. You can sign up for alerts at the link uh, listed at the bottom, tinyurl.com slash NYS NYS series. Um, and also by registering for this, you will uh, be getting updates unless you choose to unsubscribe from that. Uh, potential topics for the upcoming webinars are listed here. Uh, we will be doing a poll in the middle of this session to get a sense of which of these would be the most meaningful to you so that we can really curate this to meet your needs. Uh, these sessions are going to be coming up monthly. As I mentioned, the dates uh, are listed here. The webinars will generally take place from 12 until 1 or 1.30. The next one after this is coming up on January 18th. And this is a, a highlight for the January 18th webinar, Cultivating Partnerships, Building Relationships for Sustaining High Quality Programs. So I want to do a quick poll. Uh, before we dive in and see who's in the room today, I'm going to launch this here and ask that you fill in uh, your answers. We are trying to find out what type of organization you're with, if your district or organization has American Rescue Plan funds that you're using for its after school or summer programming, um, and if you do have those funds, if that's increased your ability to provide after school or summer programming. Once you've finished filling that out, you can also introduce yourself in the chat box. Let us know who you are uh, and what organization that you're from. And anything that you're hoping to learn in this session, that'll help us out. You can add that to the chat. All right. I'll leave the poll open for just a little bit longer. A few more folks joining. All right, and while you're finishing that up, I am going to uh, turn it over to our host, uh, Jay Roskup, who will be moderating this workshop. Thank you, Allie. Thanks everybody for making time to be here today. Um, really do hope that you'll stick with us through the series and understand sustainability as a comprehensive effort. Uh, certainly dollars and cents are an important part of that, uh, but so is leadership, so is vision, uh, so is partnership. And so really hope that uh, you'll be partners with us as we explore concepts around sustainability over the next few months, especially pertaining uh, to the use of ARP dollars as a springboard uh, for the launch of new programs, the improvement of quality of existing ones. We have with us today a couple of real experts that we are going to be able to talk with. We're going to have a chance to mine their experience a bit, and we hope to get to, to your questions too, but we have a prepared uh, set of questions that um, we really think will be uh, eye-opening for, for a lot of folks and affirming for others and we're going to just dive right in. So, um, Brett, I was wondering, uh, would you be willing to start us off here? And we're going to ask you if um, if you could come off mute and and uh, tell us how did you get how did you get started in in grant work, Brett? Sure. Uh, so first off, welcome everybody. My name is Brett Ratner. I am the vice president of grants at Good Shepherd Services. We are a New York City based nonprofit. Uh, we're a large nonprofit. Our budget's about 120 million, and we have roughly speaking 11 to 1,200 staff, both full and part time. Uh, so the way I got started in grant work was actually a bit meandering and winding. So after I graduated college, I moved to Boston because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and through that, I started working as like a stringer for a 
bunch of local newspapers and publications covering everything from school board meetings to library openings and that kind of work. Um, and that both really honed my writing skills as well as kind of really introduced me to like what, what actually goes on on the ground level in terms of like systems and local governments and how nonprofits work. Uh, I then proceeded to go get my master's at Marquette University in journalism. And then from there, I graduated in 2008. So right as the economy kind of crashed, but I was lucky enough to actually be offered a fellowship to the New York State Senate Education Committee. So uh, for those who follow New York State politics in 2008 through 2010, there was a quick blip where the state Senate was controlled by the Democrats. And so I worked as a legislative and press aide for uh, her name was State Senator Susie Oppenheimer from Westchester. And I did everything from um, constituent services. I kind of oversaw her social media, which I was not great at, but did anyway, as well as I wrote a couple of bills and just kind of really helped move the office forward. Uh, fast forward to 2010, when the state Senate flipped back to Republican hands and in Albany, it's partisan staffs. And so me and about 300 other folk were laid off because, again, flipped from Democrat to Republican control. And so through that, though, I was actually offered a job as a TV producer. Um, for what is now called, I think, let me rephrase that. When I did it, it was called YNN. It is New York One sister station for those who are New York City based. And it was a great experience. I really liked working in TV, but I also worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday from four in the morning to three in the afternoon, which was just not sustainable. And so after about nine or 10 months of doing that, I really wanted to get back into uh, like government or nonprofit work because I really found that that was my calling. I was really connected to the education and youth development work that I did as part of this, uh, as part of the state Senate Education Committee. Committee. And also, um, I was also a really good writer through my time as journalism, and just that's always been a skill that I've been blessed with. And so as I started looking for jobs, I was actually able to be connected to somebody who I had met with when I worked for the state Senate uh, through one of their advocacy days, uh, who was part of an organization, what was then called the After School Corporation, is now called Expand Ed. And so I applied for a grant writing job purely because, again, I had some skills in writing and I kind of understood the youth development field, but I had no experience in grant writing whatsoever. I couldn't tell you the difference between indirect, budget, how to frame a grant, like I had no experience whatsoever. But thankfully, my supervisor at the time took a leap of faith and hired me. And so from there, I worked for two years at Expanded Schools, uh, which really is a, you know a large funder or is a significant funder in the New York City youth development and education field. Um, did that for two years and then moved over to Good Shepherd Services where I was for six years, left that for another organization for two years and then came back to Good Shepherd uh, about a year ago. So what I always say though in regards to development and grant writing is that you know all the skills that you build throughout your life can be applicable. And so even though I had no experience in grant writing when I started, the fact that I was a pretty good writer and a pretty good editor, as well as also, um, you know, that I had some semblance of understanding of the youth development field really helped build my skills in terms of how to succeed in that field. And then the other thing I always say about grant writing is that it really helps you understand how a nonprofit operates from the back end and how systems really connect to each other, because in the end, funding is kind of what drives everything. So that's my quick backstory, Jay. So you got started in grant writing because you care about outcomes for kids and you had some writing skills and you had somebody give you a shot at it and you found some success there. Um, Holly, how about how about you? How did you get into this uh, grant writing world? Sure. Um, I'm Holly Dickinson. I'm the director of grants and district community programs at the Lockport City School District. I have a slightly uh, different bend than Brett does. Um, he's more based in uh, community-based organizations. I work for a school district, a public school district. So my background is really in education. So I started out as an art teacher and a French teacher. And people always find that a little amusing when they find out that I do grant writing and strategic planning now. It um, doesn't seem like a fit, but I personally feel that, you know, having that creative edge has really been beneficial for me in grant writing. Um, as far as how I got started, um, I think you know, I wrote my very first grant for $500 uh, because I was working on my master's thesis in uh, fiber arts um, and I really needed looms for my students. And so I wrote a little grant and got my looms and that was the very first grant I wrote. Uh, the next grant I wrote was a little different. Um, I moved from the classroom and became a, a school administrator. And during my internship, my cooperating superintendent um, asked me to write a grant, a $1.5 million state education grant. I had never done anything that size before, but of course I'm an intern and I said, absolutely, I will write that. It'll be great. And it was a struggle. The first big grant that I wrote was really a challenge. Um, it was a totally different way of writing um, than I was used to. It's technical writing. 
um, and being a creator and a creative person, it really um, used that analytical side of my brain, which lo and behold, I had, um, and just hadn't been really using that muscle for some time. So I wrote that grant, it was awarded, um, and then they hired me out of my internship to manage that grant at the school district. And that's kind of how my grant writing career began. And as it turned out, it was like Brett mentioned, it was a skill set I didn't know I had. And not only was it a strong skill set, and I continued to win grants, but I really found that I loved it. I love the, um, the puzzle, the analytical piece. Um, I love the idea of being able to create opportunities and programs for kids and families that wouldn't exist without the work that I do. Um, it became um, something that was a skill I was proud to have, just something that was much more of a passion. Um, every time you get that grant award letter, it's like Christmas all over again, right? It's just the best feeling. Um, so short story, but I hope a sweet one. No, I think that is really uh, important. And I hope that our participants today um, are wondering, maybe they're wondering themselves, could I be a grant writer? Or maybe they're looking to see who in my organization uh, could I ask, or how do I find a grant writer? And I think that uh, part of what I heard from both of you is find somebody with some skill and some savvy and somebody that's willing to jump in and give it a go and uh, no time like the present to learn. So speaking of learning in order to write a grant, you, you got to you gotta go find them. You got you to gotta know where they are. Brett, could you talk for a minute or two about uh, where you look to find opportunities for, for your organization or where you've looked for funding opportunities in the past? Sure. Um, so we attempt to take a varied approach in order to identify grants and to prospect. So that takes the form of a number of things. For those who are in the city, there's something called the city's passport system, which is how um, the city receives all grant proposals. It's similar to Grants Gateway or Grants.gov if you've ever submitted a state or a federal grant. And so that blasts out anytime an opportunity that the city is um, wanting to contract for, that blasts out an email to everybody. So if you have an account through the passport system, um, you get notified. Nine times out of 10, they're not particularly useful to our organization. You know, we're not going for a grant to try to do like garbage collection in Staten Island, so to speak, but we monitor these things every single time they come out. So that's just one way that we identify I'm sorry, public grants through the city system. The other things we do, and this is much more private focused, is for those organizations that are are our sister organizations. So Good Shepherd Services is the law is the largest foster care provider in the city. We have 20 after school programs in seven community schools. Uh, we pro we run programming for youth in the justice system and a myriad of other approaches. And so as we're prospecting, we look at annual reports, we look at 990s, and we look at all these other documentation that our sister organizations have. Because one of the fallacies that I think a lot of people hold true um, in grant writing, but which is actually not true, is if you apply for funding from an organization, you're not taking your sister organization's funding, right? It is two very distinct pots. It's not if you get a grant, therefore they lose a grant. And so oftentimes we work to identify funders that we do not currently know, of, but, but that again, support our sister organizations. And then from there, we look at their websites. We do Googling to see if there are any press releases. Uh, we use different systems to see if we, if our boards have any connections to their staff or their board members. Like we really look for those ins for two reasons. One is because a lot of times foundations just won't accept a grant proposal unless they've invited you to. But also, even if it's a submission, um, you know, like a blind submission, so to speak, it will be taken more seriously and looked upon more favorably if there's a connection, so to speak. That's not to say if you do a blind submission, it won't be reviewed with the rigor that it deserves, just that if you have that connection it is a stronger um, it is a stronger starting point. So that's one thing we do. Uh, there's something it's now called Candid, but it used to be called the, found, the Foundation Directory Online, which is so it is a free system. But if you want the more powerful version of it as well, uh, you have to pay for it. But that is a basically a clearinghouse where you can put in either like after schools if you want a content area or a geographical um, location or if you want to do like a specific foundation you can put them in and it brings up the portfolios of all of these all of these different funders and then from there you can see are you a good fit you know are you the requisite size do you serve the right geographical areas is your target population aligned to the foundation so we do that a lot of times either if we come across a foundation that we don't know anything about that's a good starting point and resource or sometimes we'll just put in again 
after schools or youth justice and just kind of see what's out there. Sometimes the information is a bit outdated. Sometimes it's not relevant to exactly what you're learning, what you're looking for. But again, it's at least a starting point. Uh, we also have a lot of conversations with our existing funders. So Good Shepherd Services has at any given time roughly 50 to 60 private foundations. And it ranges from smaller 1500 grants all the way up to we get $2 million a year from the Robin Hood Foundation. We get 10 million over five years from the Oak Foundation. So really significant seven figure grants. And so what a lot of times we'll do is we'll talk to those funders and say, hey, you know, do y'all have any peers that you can connect us to? Do you know, do you have any thoughts as to who we could potentially approach? And can you either make the connection or at the very least, just kind of give us the name so that we can introduce ourselves as well. Um, so that's another way that we look to attract finding is to really partner with our um, funders, because again, we're all attempting to move the work forward in the same basic way. We may take different approaches, have different models, different, different strategic visions. But within that being said, again, we're all working towards the same ends. Um, something else we do is our executive director and a lot of our executive staff also really try to you know, go out and meet with funders, whether that's at special events or that's at, um, you know, honorary dinners or whatnot, kind of like really try to glad hand, so to speak. And again, we are lucky in that we are a large organization and our name really is synonymous throughout New York City. But that's also how we've got introduced to a lot of funders as well, is to really try to have our executive director and our executive level staff be out there at all times. We're on a ton of email blasts, everything from philanthropy today to different foundations, uh, which a lot of those times also have grants. And I think the New York State Network for Youth Success has an amazing email blast as well. Um, so that's a plug for them. As well as, you know, just a lot of times also, we really just try to do a lot of Googling, you know, foundations, and especially now with smaller family foundations, are always popping up as individuals, either in the tech sections tech sector or the financial services sector or whatnot are really trying to, um, you know, individuals who have made a lot of money and are trying to step into philanthropy, there's always foundations that are being created. And then the last thing I'll say quickly is we partner with the city's Department of Education, Department of Youth and Community Development on a lot of public grants where they're the lead and we subcontract, as well as we also try to partner with a lot of our our sister organizations um, who are applying as lead but to subcontract as well, which is an avenue that we've really found can be effective is sometimes you don't have to be lead sometimes to try to get yourself written into a grant, you know, at a $60,000 level, so that you can have one staff person funded, so to speak. So to really think, think strategically around who should apply for lead. And if it's not you, if it's a sister organization, what does that mean? And how can you partner with them? Brett, that was a lot. Thank you so much. I heard some technical terms in there. Um, Form 990, uh, folks may not be uh, familiar with that. Could you just explain that real quick? Sure. In full transparency, I'm going to say what I'm going to say is 70% accurate. I reserve the right to be 30%. We'll take 70% accurate. accurate. That's good enough for the holiday season. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's it's basically your tax form, right? That an organization submits every single year. And so it won't always have a ton of relevant information, but it will sometimes list your largest funders. You can go to any organization's website, so to speak, and it will be listed as part of their financial page, so to speak. And so more of it, it's going to be your annual report um, is what really will list the funders. And that will also list the giving level. So the 25,000 to 49,999,000, and it will list all the foundations, so to speak, that are part of that level as well. But sometimes the form 990s will include like the largest funders, and you can just kind of see those names as well. So. Thanks, Brett. Uh, one more quick, uh, before I'm going to ask Holly to, to add in, um, you said the system you used was called Candid. Is that what I heard? For Correct. Looking? Yep. So it's C-A-N-D-I-D. If you Google that or what used to be, it used to be called the Foundation Directory Online. So if you Google that as well, Candid will pop up. Um, and, and, there's, again, and there's other there's, systems. We're not promoting any particular product here. We're just sharing the one that you happen to use. Yeah. Of course. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Brent. Um, Holly, you are in a different geographic area. And you're also sitting in a different kind of chair. You're in a school district chair, which is a municipality, right? Taxing power. School districts have taxing power. Um, so you might have some different methodologies and some the same. Can you can you add to or elaborate on some of what Brett shared with us about finding opportunities? Absolutely. So yeah, we are in a different situation. We do have a tax base. We have a general fund, which is um, the largest, you know, um, most of our funds come from our general fund budget. Um, our operating budget for the school district. We also get a um, considerable amount of money um, that is what we consider non-competitive formula grant dollars from the state. It's federal flow through money through the state for um, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. So we get our title programs, for example. 
Um, that is, again, not competitive. What we're focusing on today are competitive awards. And then all the competitive awards um, that we seek are really driven by our strategic plan. So I think that's a really important part, not just for a school district, but for any organization to ensure that um, as you are going through the process of seeking grants and opportunities that they're directly tied to your strategic planning. What are your um, initiatives are you wanting to move forward? Uh, what are the programs that you're really focused on? Who are the, um, the, the target groups that you're really focused on supporting? And really having that really clear and concise so that when you go into the grant search uh, mode, that you know um, it's a big world out there, right? It's a big world. There's no one stop shop where you can go and, and pick up I want a grant on this. It's not going to happen. You have to do a lot of searching, as Brett alluded to. So being really, really clear about what you're looking for is really of primary importance. Um, for my part, we do mostly um, state, New York State Education Department and um, other state department grants and also federal grants, federal education, federal OJP, federal agencies, USDA. So mostly really large, um, several hundred thousand to multi-million dollar grants programs at the federal and state level that are specific to um, programs or initiatives we're trying to start or sustain. Um, as far as looking for those opportunities, we have some very specific places to look, right? Um, we're not kind of, we don't do a lot of foundation work. There's not a lot of uh, corporate or foundation grant writing. There's a small amount of it. Um, occasionally some of our teachers, for example, will have a small program they're interested in running and I'll direct them toward a foundation grant that maybe is a few thousand dollars to fund that uh, individual program. But those are kind of few and far between. Um, one thing I have done when I worked in the private sector and I started a grants development department um, with an agency was build my own database. And I found that to be the most helpful. So you don't need anything fancy to do that. If you are uh, skilled with Excel or with uh, Google Sheets, that should be sufficient. And it was a lot of looking at the NOFA. So um, the, um, the annual um, national funding opportunities that come out usually in November. And we start looking and doing a lot of research and built an internal database that we consistently maintained to give us an understanding of what's kind of out there in the grant world that's specific to the things that we need. And it took some time to build that database, but once it was built, it was a relatively small amount of time to maintain that database. And it became really, really important and useful as we move forward um, working uh, for ourselves, but also for clients as well um, to, to quickly access opportunities as they arose. So I think those are probably the, the most important aspects. I also have a custom designed uh, calendar on my wall that I maintain. It's, it's a kind of like a wheel shape and it kind of puts the landscape out for the next 10 years of what we expect the landscape to look like for grant funding, which of course changes. And as Brett alluded to earlier, it changes with, um, you know, who's, who's in political power. We pay attention to that, right? We pay attention to state regulations, you know, um, Executive Order 18 regarding uh, domestic terrorism, terrorism in schools has really had a huge impact on the grant funding landscape and what that looks like for, for education world. So paying attention to those things really can help um, um, help us to kind of find out what's out there and what what's available for us that meets our initiatives and our goals. Really appreciate that, Holly. And um, tying to a strategic plan, knowing what your needs are. I'm thinking back to that initial story you told us about how your first grant was because you had kids that needed a loom. It sounds like you're doing a little more complicated work now than then, and uh, but still that same basic, this is the need in front of us. We know what that need is, and we're going to look to meet that need. Um, so we're looking about, we're, um, we're trying to figure things out. Brad, I want to come back to you for a second. Um, two pieces here. You know, uh, Holly started us down the track of uh, how do you decide what to go after, but I, I, you know, if you want to, if you want to add into that and also then like, are there any nuts and bolts uh, for grant writing that you want to add in? You mentioned like the city contract place or, or things of that nature that um, their city contract website. Um, what are some nuts and bolts about, about getting an application started or finding, uh, finding your way as far as putting, putting an application together that people should think about just the basics. Sure. So I'll tackle those two questions. Um, so the first thing is that in regards to like putting a grant together, I think 
a couple of things really come to mind is make sure that everything aligns. So for example, if you say that you are going to hire three staff people in question one, don't say you're going to hire five staff people in question seven or put seven staff people in your budget, right? Like you are telling the story through this grant. So really make sure that everything aligns. Also make sure that you are not including stuff in the grant that is outside of the scope of the grant. So I can remember when I first got started, uh, the organization that I was working for at the time, we applied for a literacy grant, but we, in the rush to get it in on time, we submitted a budget that included a lifeguard. And right, we didn't get the grant. And one of the feedback was obviously, well, you're doing a literacy program. Why is there a lifeguard in the budget? The honest response is we didn't catch it in time. But again, it goes back to you're telling a story. So make sure that everything aligns and make sure that what it is you are including really from question one through the budget through every other part of it really talks to each other. Um, something else in regards to the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and so I say this as somebody who has both been a grant writer for a number of years, as well as has acted as a reviewer. I've been a reviewer for the state before through the extended school day school violence prevention grant, as well as I've been a reviewer for a number of private foundations that have done open RFPs. And try to keep your sentences short and sweet, try to not really, really use technical jargon. And I say that because, again, speaking from my own experiences, I was reviewing these grants at night after having worked a full day of work, um, you know, walking a dog, all these other things. And like the reviewers are human. And so a lot of times, and this is unfortunate, but if you're reviewing a 10 page grant proposal at nine o'clock at night, you might feel a little glazed over, a little exhausted. And if you have one paragraph that's like 12 lines long, that in that reviewer is just going to kind of like zone out, so to speak. And so really try to keep things short and sweet and very punchy. Try to keep things as simple to understand as possible and try to put yourself in the reviewer's place in terms of, you know, if the question has five different parts, one of the things I've learned is like put headers. So put a capitalization. So if the first part of the question is what is your organization's mission, put mission and then address that in five sentences. And the next thing, if the next part of that question is in what geographical area do you serve, put geography in a very um, in bold and capitalized and then address that part. And the reason you should do that is because what will end up happening is it will catch the reviewer's eye. They'll see, oh, the question asks these four parts. Oh, they address these four parts. And if they skim it quickly or whatnot, you'll, you will get a lot more points because again, it is jumping out to the reviewer. So that's the other thing that I would really highlight. And then the last thing I'll highlight in regards to this question is for, and this is just my own anecdotal experience, for public stuff, it tends to be more um, technical, whereas private foundations, you can tell more of a story. You can use more flowery language, A, because there probably aren't character counts or word limits as there are for public stuff, but also B, the relationship is different. With public RFPs, it's a somebody who's reviewing who probably does not know your organization. There's tax money behind it. So there are rules and regulations in terms of how, of how it has to be spent, whereas private foundations don't have that rules and regulations and that kind of, um, they may know your organization through a series of meetings. So they're much more invested in anecdotal stories, in participant stories, that type of work. And then in regards to your first question, Jay, about how it is we assess grants, the couple of things I'll, I will flag are one, does it align to your mission? A lot of times folks see money and then they get themselves into mission drift or try to really turn themselves into like a pretzel, so to speak, in order to go for the grant. But you will find that that is both not effective and you'll dig yourself into a hole like really make sure the grant aligns to what it is you want to do both from a program model perspective from a dei perspective um, from all these different perspectives but make sure it's something you want to apply for and then the other thing i will really flag which is something we try to do strong due diligence around is does it fully fund your program or is it going to blow a hole in your budget? So, you know, $200,000 may seem like a lot, but if you have to hire five staff and have to purchase Metro cards or transportation and have to purchase supplies and you want to include indirect, you may all of a sudden find that the program costs $250,000 to run. And all you've done is create a program with a $50,000 budget deficit that either you need to figure out a way to cut expenses or use what are called general operating dollars that your agency has. So as you start the grant writing process, build out a mock budget, excuse me, and make sure that what it is you're applying for actually is fully funded. We have definitely turned down a number of RFPs because at the very beginning, it seemed great, but then we went through the budgeting process and we realized this both isn't going to fit because it's not going to fully fund what we want to do. And their metrics in terms of how they're going to evaluate are unrealistic or these other things that made this grant not nearly as appealing. And so again, when people see money and I'm as guilty as the next person, you automatically want to go for it, but like stop it, actually think through all components of, is this something that makes sense for your organization? I appreciate that, Brett. Holly, you were talking in our in our pre-call conversation about um, the importance of evaluation. And I think both you and Brett were talking about 
do you got to be careful about the data collection? And that's another thing that you look at as you're thinking about applying for a grant. Could you talk about that a little more? Sure. Um, so starting with the end in mind, right? That's how you should always approach every uh, grant opportunity is really looking at a few things. And I agree every, with everything that Brett had to say, um, including, you know, making sure you have the capacity to implement a grant. So um, if you if you are awarded, you have to be able to, to have the staff with the expertise to actually implement the grant program. Uh, you can write the most beautiful grant in the world. You can have it awarded, but if it's not doable and you're smiling, Jay, because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. If it's not doable, then it's not gonna really help anyone. Um, but we're talking about evaluation. So starting with the end in mind is really, um, really, I think people, my experience has been that by and large, people kind of look at evaluation as kind of something you do later, right? This is something I don't have to worry about right now. I'm gonna put together a little evaluation plan, but I'll be more for, focused on collecting data, analyzing that data once I get the grant. But that's a, a bit of a fallacy. You need to start thinking about evaluation from the beginning of writing the grant proposal. What are they asking for? What are the things they're expecting you to evaluate? Do you have the capacity to do that? Do you really understand what they're asking you to evaluate? And do you feel that your program is going to adequately address those measures so that you will move that needle and achieve the goals that you've decided to achieve? So always starting with understanding uh, your evaluation process really thoroughly. I'm a big proponent, especially earlier on when I was first beginning, uh, first in my grant writing career, of working with an external agency, or if you are fortunate enough to work in an agency that has evaluators on staff, um, I'd work with your evaluation team on staff or contract with external evaluators, at least initially, until you get to a place where you really understand evaluation data and that evaluation plan. They can be really tricky to write if you don't have a lot of experience with evaluating. So lean on those individuals to help you in that process, at least until you get pretty proficient with it. Um, you're gonna be asked to do a lot of uh, goal setting, objectives, performance measures, work plans, you know, logic models in these processes, especially when you're doing these big multi-million dollar heavy lift grants, they're gonna expect that from you. So that's a skill set to build up on um, if you don't have it already. Uh, so don't be afraid to do that. Um, oh, I see a nice comment. The value will help to maximize the points. And absolutely. Great, great comment just came through about how that evaluator can really help you maximize your points. Um, not only in that evaluation plan section, but throughout the entire proposal. People have a tendency to wanna you know, say, we're gonna do 50 measures. <laughs> we're gonna do everything. We're gonna change the world. This is gonna be amazing. We get really excited about our grant program, but oftentimes that can really put you in hot water. Uh, it's better to have really good, really thoughtful, have much fewer objectives and performance measures that you really feel will be thoroughly addressed by the proposal, the proposed program, and really stick with those. And I think an evaluator can really help you gain perspective on, you know, does your program really match the objectives that this grant's looking for, and is it measurable? Because ultimately, you want to be successful, especially if you're building your reputation. So if you're building your personal reputation or your reputation as an organization, you don't want to get a grant that you fail at or that you bomb at. You want to be sure that you're set up for success, success if you are awarded. I think that that is a wonderful point that one success can lead to the next and one grant can lead to the next. Um, I think one of the best grant writing guides ever written was if you give a mouse a cookie. Uh, and if you don't know that children's book, you should look it up. But uh, basically talks about how one thing can lead to another. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about partnership. A lot of times you need partners uh, when you're writing these grants. And so I wanted to create kind of an imaginary scenario where now, Brett, I know that you're down uh, in the city and, and Holly, you're closer to Buffalo, but let's imagine that you two were operating in the same place. Um, how might you partner and work together um, as a nonprofit and a school district. And Holly, I'm just going to ask you, you were talking about all that. So if you could just keep rolling with that, that would be that would be great. And Brett, you can be ready to chime in after. Well, I'm guessing that Brett has done this too. I mean, this is something that we do all the time, right? As we work with many different community-based organizations, agencies, um, you know, municipal um, entities, um, and partner with them. There's very few grants out there that really uh, a lot of substance that don't ask for a partnership, right? That don't require some form of partnership, um, whether it's informal or whether there's a signed MOU or MOA that they expect you to submit with the grant application or at least a, a, a partnership agreement of some type. 
So how does that typically look? Um, well, when you have that relationship with your existing community-based organization, speaking from the school district perspective, um, you, you reach out, you have a conversation. These are shared goals that we have. This is projects, usually it's projects you've um, either worked on before or you've had conversation around um, this, the same type of um, outcomes that this grant is, is, um, is providing or is, is requiring you to write program about. And you open up dialogue and start having conversation about how this can be a beneficial um, partnership. Now, to Brett's point earlier too, you know, you don't always have to be the LEA. And I think as school districts in particular, um, always think they have to be the lead agency, right? We always wanna be in charge. We always wanna be wearing the, the pants, right? And um, I think it's important to remember is you don't always have to be that lead agency. The, your community partner can be the lead agency too, which takes a little pressure off you as the school district to do all the management of a grant program, but you still get the benefit um, of the service um, agreement that's involved. Um, you know, um, I think that that partnership piece can be incredibly valuable. It can be, be a really a strengthening thing, but it can also be a destructive thing if you're not really cognizant of being a good partner. Being a good partner is really important and a good partner isn't someone who says, I want everything and I want you to give everything to me. A good partner who is one who says, I see you community-based organization. I see these are your needs. How can I help you meet your needs? Well, you help me meet my needs. And I think that's a really important thing when you come to that table is be prepared to be a true partner with your community-based organizations and agencies and not um, really be just looking to see what they can do for you, but what you can also do for them. I think that way you're set up for better success and much better communication in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I so I agree with everything that was just said. A couple of things I think I'll just highlight. One is, which Holly talked about a bit before, is around capacity, especially these larger state or federal grants. They are a bear to manage from like a billing perspective, from a contract management perspective, from a hiring perspective. And so, A, as you're assessing a grant, also assess from the back office admin support perspective, because you may be able to hire the program staff to do it. But if your fiscal staff can't handle the management of it, that will also be a challenge. Um, as well as when it comes from partnerships perspective. So we partner with a lot of different city agencies um, on many different grants we have. And a couple of things we look at are, you know, complementary skill sets. So Good Shepherd is a youth development organization. So we employ a lot of credible messengers and a lot of staff from the communities that we support who are really deeply grounded in those communities. And so that's the value add that we bring to a lot of grants. Whereas like when we partner with the DOE, they're educators, right? That's the value add that they bring. And so to understand both the strengths and your areas that you may not be as strong in when you go into that grant process is very important. We rarely, if ever, take on the education aspects of a grant because that's not where we, that's not our strength. Whereas the DOE, we sometimes either feels, and again, we have a very strong relationship with the DOE, so I most certainly don't wish to slander them in any way, shape, or form. And the DOE stands for the Department of Education in the city. Um, they sometimes, you know, either believe that they have a certain skill sets that they don't, which in that case gets us a little bit leery as do we even want to be part of this partnership because, you know, it, it will be challenging from the get-go. Or conversely, they come to the table very much understanding what it is they bring, and then we feel that that strengthens it. You know, we also sometimes partner with a lot of our city agencies on grants in a more informal capacity, so through referral services, um, or sometimes just simply put on like a very small piece, so to do a couple of workshops here and there. And then, and the reason we do that is because we don't want to be the lead on an, on an organization, I'm sorry, on an application because it is too large and it is too in-depth, but we feel that we can really support some of the communities that we work in and really be a strong partner through that as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll also say is politics with a small p. Sometimes trying to read between the lines of a state or federal grant, even if CBOs and LEAs, or in our case, the city's Department of Education, um, even if they both might qualify reading between the lines. Sometimes you can tell what, but the RFP is really written for A or B. And so understanding from that politics with the small P perspective, who may be the stronger applicant as lead and who may be the stronger applicant as a partner, because a lot of times, even if an RFP is open to everybody, it's really tailored towards one or the other. And just understanding that just because you are technically qualified for something does not make you the strongest applicant. And so Last thing I'll say is when we do want to partner, we have contacts like program managers who manage a lot of our contracts. We reach out to them. If it's a higher level, sometimes our executive director will reach higher up in a city agency, but we'll really try to start the partnership early. We even passed on grants because uh, we have not been able to develop the partnership in enough time. If it's two weeks until a deadline and you don't have the partnership done yet, 
don't chase it. You're just going to get yourself into a much bigger issue, especially if the grant comes out every year. And so sometimes we'll say, no, we're going to put a hold on it. We're going to flag it for next year. And then five months before that RFP comes out, we will start the process of building that partnership up. So we'll meet with the school districts or the school principals and lay that groundwork. So when the RFP does come out, you can hit the ground running and you have that stronger foundation to build upon, as opposed to trying to throw together something in two weeks that even if you get funded, you'll probably miss a lot of things and you'll have a lot of catch up to do. So. I really want to, you know, highlight that point, Brad. I really appreciate that about, you know, you don't wait to the last minute to form a partnership, right? The partnerships should need to be pre-existing, you know, investing in those partnerships uh, well ahead of time and having those conversations with your partner organizations around the shared measures, around the shared goals, about what you have in common, what everybody brings to the table well in advance. So you already have the idea in your mind. You already know what you're looking for, what you want to go for, how you want to work together. It's just a matter of finding the funding to support what you already want to do. Again, it's not chasing those dollars, not suddenly saying, oh, there's some money. Maybe we can collaborate something together and, and make something happen. It's not a recipe for success. It can be really stressful and a huge failure, and it could take years of your life away. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, you know, when you start to go after different funding streams, um, you, you get periodic funding, right? A grant starts, a grant stops, but ideally we want our programs, our client facing, our family facing, our youth facing programs to continue regardless of periodic funding. So um, partnerships, I think, you know, from what I was hearing you both say are definitely a strategy for sustainability. Um, Brett, I was wondering if you could keep talking about, I'm going to set you up for this and then ask Allie to set loose a poll. Um, if you could talk about other strategies for sustainability, maybe including partnerships, but other ones just for keeping grants going. Um, and I also just want to alert everybody that is tuning in right now that we're going to put a poll out and ask you what are some other topics that might be helpful to prioritize in our sustainability series our next conversation is about partnerships, and I think it's a really important topic when it comes to grant writing and the idea that um, Holly might be able to bring a grant to Brett or Brett to Holly, and they could work together and say, hey, did you see this one? Would you like to partner on this one? And so that you're really working as a group, and it's not just every person out for uh, for themselves. Um but as that polls in the field, uh, Brad, we're going to ask folks to multitask a bit and also keep an ear to what advice you can offer for keeping funding going. A good shepherd, it's no good if those young people that are counting on you are just kicked to the curb because a, a grant came to an end. That that doesn't work. So how do you how do you juggle all that? Sure. And so I will preface my answer by saying that because we are a large organization, $120 million odd budget, we are lucky in that we have what are known as general operating funds um, that a number of much smaller CBOs don't have. And those are raised through special events, through board give get, through annual campaigns. And so I fully acknowledge that some of our, our sustainability approaches may not be viable for everybody yet. But with that as the caveat, we do a couple of things. So we do what's called braiding and blending public and private funding. So what that means is we apply for a public contract as like the anchor contract, right? So it will run three, five, six years. And that provides you with a bit of a space to really get this initiative up and running. And but it may not fully cover all expenses. So we do two things. We try to really be very careful and cognizant about what exactly it is we are applying for. And does it fully cover? Because, again, we don't want to take on a grant that you know, all of a sudden creates a $100,000 budget gap. But in addition to that, we then try to layer on top of that public contract private funding, which is the braiding of it, through other foundation grants, corporate grants. So we have a lot of corporate partners that in addition to doing corporate volunteer work, also allow us to apply for smaller grants. Um, if it's banks, it might be through financial literacy or kind of whatever aligns to their business model. So we try to blade, uh, sorry, braid and blend those private and public dollars because what that ends up doing is you have that anchor contract, but then you have these additional funds on top of it that tend to be a bit more flexible and tend to allow you to really shift those funds to cover any expenses that may arise. We also try to leverage uh, our partners for in-kind support or match or um, that type of work. So what that means is is if we are hosting a program, maybe one of our partners can provide space. So therefore, we don't have to pay for the rent because all of a sudden we have that that is taken care of because, again, one of our partners provides space. Or maybe they will provide 
uh, some staff that can come on site a couple times a week that they will cover the expense store Let's do that in kind donation that doesn't take up our money as well. Um, and then another way that we really try to do sustainability work is really getting a jump on it. So if that contract is three years, don't wait until it's two years and nine months done and then say, uh oh, now I have to really start scrambling to find funding because public or private funding with very few exceptions takes both a long time to cultivate those relationships and then a long time to get that funding. It's not gonna happen in six weeks. And so what we try to do is if it's a three-year contract as we head into that third year, so a year out in advance, we start planning out do we want to sustain this program because it aligns to our model? Yes, we do. Okay, what does that mean? Both can we apply for renewal funding for our anchor contract, but then also what other funds do we need to try to track down in order to really continue to ensure that the program is high quality? And then from there, we try to come up with a targeted approach. So maybe that means we talk with our current funders and say, we have this new initiative, we need $50,000 to sustain it. And again, this is just an example. You know, can we talk to you about it? Do you have any partner organizations? We look for open RFPs, but we really try to plan it out really far in advance because, again, you want to get a jump on it and you don't want to find yourself in that last second scrambling. And then this goes back to being a large organization. If worse comes to worse and it is sustainable, we sometimes float our programs for a year or so through those general operating dollars because we understand the value that they provide and how close they are to our mission. And so we'll sometimes use general operating dollars, which are gold for nonprofits, and we'll use those dollars in order to try to sustain um, again until we're able to find other funding. So that tends to be how we do it. Thankfully, we've been lucky. We've been able to sustain a lot of our um, programs because anchor contracts as a general statement you, they're easy is not the right word, but it is easier to renew them than to start up a program, especially if, as Holly indicated, you have strong metrics to back up what you're doing. So those anchor contracts really come from the partnerships that we're going to talk about uh, in our next uh, in our next conversation on January 18th. And Holly, as a school district, you you may well be a provider of an anchor contract uh, to to some local nonprofits. Um, we're we're coming up here to. Uh, getting getting closer to the end. So I'm hoping folks could start to think about questions you might have. Um, I did want to ask uh, you both for any, any tips you have, just in case we've got listeners out there that are either thinking, hmm, I might want to try my hand at grant writing, or I might want to give somebody in my organization the license to give it a go. I'm going to calendar out some time for them to to give it a try and to try after. Is there any just uh, a couple of of quick pointers that you might have for uh, our our fellow future or fellow current grant writers out there that you would you would offer, Holly? And then Brett, that'll come to you too shortly. Sure. I think the, the thing about grant writing is is the only way to learn it is to do it. Um, you're not going to go to college for it, right? There's very few classes out there. Um, I remember when I first was was getting started, I was like, hey, let me, let me see who's out there teaching a, a two-hour workshop on this at the local community college or something. There was nothing, right? There was nothing. I mean, maybe there is in other areas, but as far as where I'm concerned in Western New York, there was very little out there. You're very much on your own. So I think that really the only way to go about it is to do it, um, is to do it and try your hand at it. Uh, go with something that's fairly straightforward and Maybe don't write a $1.5 million grant for your very first attempt um, and expect great results, but, but, but give it a go. Uh, find somebody at your organization who will support you in that effort, who will act as a, as a second set of eyes. You're going to need that second set of eyes and maybe a third set of eyes in the process. Somebody who's willing to read it and give you really good um, uh, feedback um, and, and critique on your work. Um, I think the only way to learn it is to do it. Another uh, great technique, which when you're a little further down into the process is to become a reviewer. So through the process of reviewing other grant applications, it gives you an idea of um, what other people are out there doing. Um, gives you some, some tips and some pointers. You can see what, you, what works well and what doesn't work so well. Um, and there are some national associations like the Grant Professionals Association that you can um, you know, connect with and they provide a lot of resources and they have national conferences as well. Um, that you can participate in. There are some local chapters too. They have regional chapters as well that um, that you can you know re receive some information and connect with the grant writing uh, landscape in your area. Um, and generally, I find that grant writers are really supportive of other grant writers. Um, they know it's tough field. Um, it, it's very niche, and that frequently you're very alone in your organization. You may be the only one who does what you do in your entire organization, and people maybe not really understand exactly what it is you do you're often in a position of having to educate and explain to others what your role is. 
Um, so it can be really helpful to connect with, with other people in your area, whether they're a school district or a nonprofit um, to help support. And that's, we know, that's really, Jay, what you and I and Brett are doing, right, is we're connecting with each other through our work. Um, and we too share ideas about what our experiences are um, in the world of grants. Um, just really quick, if you don't mind, I just want to mention a couple things about sustainability, I think were really um, important in, from the school district perspective. I mean, Brett gives an amazing um, understanding of that from the community-based organization perspective. But I just want to touch on sustainability in regards to capacity building, right? So in the school district world, when we get a, a large grant, we're always focused on building the internal capacity to stay, sustain that long term with or without additional funding. So frequently we anticipate not having funding post grant award termination. So we're often not seeking for follow up funding from other sources. We're often seeking for either having some of the expenses absorbed into the general fund or the general operating budget. But largely we're looking to create um, policies and procedures and um, capacity. Um, within our existing staff to sustain these programs long-term. So that's a really important thing to consider as well, that policy creation, which will help um, whatever new program you're initiating be sustainable over the change of administration, change of leadership, right? And also you know, have that internal capacity within your organization to, to continue moving forward past grant funding termination. So just wanted to add that little bit there as far as sustainability is concerned. A value add for sure, Holly, thank you. Brad, any quick pointers for any potential potential uh, fellow grant writers out there? I mean, I think so. I think what Holly said is spot on. The only thing I would add is just have a thick skin and don't take it personally. You know, I've heard grant writing con uh, compared to baseball, and that if you bat three hundred, uh, you're doing well, but that means you get out seven out of every ten times, and it's the same thing with grant writing. We are rejected more times than I care to count. And as you can ask my dog or my partner, that doesn't mean I don't rant and rave to them but it's not personal, right? We've been rejected because folks want to fund smaller organizations because they want more geographic, like whatever it may be. It's not a reflection on you. It's not a reflection on anything you did or your um, proposal, but you will get rejected. And even if you think this is the best opportunity for me, we are spot on and absolutely are the perfect fit. You may be, and you still may get rejected. So again, don't take it personally, have a thick skin, rant and rave for a second, and then just put it on the back burner and continue. Um, and it's hard. Again, I've been doing this for 12 years and I still ran and rave. But again, you do, you just have to internalize it is not you and it is not a reflection on who you are. Brett, that is a great way uh, to encourage people to take a try and uh, to not um, to not be discouraged by any short term failures as they make a long term progression towards capacity building work in their organization and for youth work. I want to welcome uh, Trudy or Allie, but I think it's Trudy, um, to share about one of the partners that I continually put into my own grant applications. Uh, the Network for Youth Success is a powerful partner. They offer trainings like their, their JEDI training, uh, justice, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion training at no cost. And so when I include that in my grants, that is uh, an instance, right, for me to show partnership, for me to show a value add, for me to show that I'm bringing to the table something that the funder doesn't have to cover everything, uh, and that I'm building a broader coalition around whatever work it is that that I'm that I'm pushing forward. So uh, I am consistently reaching out to the network to ask for partnership uh, in in grant writing and in in seeking program advancement and quality measurement. And I just want to give Trudy a minute to share. Uh, Trudy, we've got six minutes left on the call here, so you've got less than that to, to run us through really quick a ton of resources. No worries. Thank you so much, Jay. And uh, I just want to share a little bit about the network and who we are. So we are the statewide after-school network, and we work with 49 other state after-school networks uh, across the country and uh, also the National After-School Alliance. And we are the state affiliate for the National After School Association, uh, also the state lead for the National Girls Collaborative Project and the Backbone Agency for the New York State Community Schools Network. And uh, we are committed to strengthening the capacity and commitment of programs, communities, and professionals to increase access to high quality programs and services outside of traditional classroom. Um, so 
Uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so we have a ton of resources, as um, uh, Jay mentioned, uh, a few that I want to point to, uh, which could help you in terms from an information perspective. I know folks have been asking about uh, resources, which uh, hopefully as time goes on, we'll be able to share uh, those um, links. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that we do have a web page dedicated to uh, the American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about what is available in for school districts, um, how you can partner with school districts, or how school districts can also work with community-based partners. We do have a collated list, uh, not by all means exhaustive, but a way to start of community partners that school districts can also be engaging in this process. So highly encourage you to check that um, webpage out if you're not familiar with the American Rescue Plan and what um, the opportunities there are um, around the use of these funds. I also wanted to uh, mention that we have our guidebook on school community partnerships. Uh, so I know um, partnerships have come up quite a bit, and, and also as we've been talking about sustainability. And this guidebook, uh, guidebook offers um, some recommendations and uh, perspectives to really help uh, towards uh, being a true partner, as Holly was talking about early on, um, so that you can advance your goals uh, as uh, either an organization or a school district or other. Um, we also have resources focused on quality, uh, so we have resources around uh, starting new programs, after school programs, or if you're a new program and you're looking for the nuts and bolts of how to continue um, to scale your program, access grants, uh, other um, quality uh, resources, uh, we have information on that as well. Uh, we have our quality self-assessment tool, which is a free tool translated in 10 languages and really a way for current programs to self-access on how they do and around quality and think of ways to be able to uh, advance um, in, in their work as well. I also wanted to mention our school aid child care credential, uh, which is uh, really uh, an opportunity for after school professionals who are looking to uh, advance and further their career within uh, the after school world uh, and it provides uh, an education um, qualifier um, and really helps to advance the uh, high quality programming that we have been talking about. Um, we also have the uh, after school program accreditation, which is for organizations, uh, not individuals, for them to be able to be accredited as a high quality program, which is also very much important when you're putting together a grant to be able to speak of these uh, uh, important qualifications as well. I also wanted to mention that uh, we also do professional development. So we offer health and safety uh, trainings for staff. We actually have a distance learning option as well. Um, so this is something that um, if you're not able to do it in person, there are opportunities for you to be able to involve uh, yourself in other ways as well. Uh, the last piece is also around our site leader institute, which uh, is a cohort style program brings together uh, new leaders and supervisors within after school and helps coach them to be you know, even better uh, supervisors and leaders in their role for after school. Uh, next slide. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we work very closely with our 15 regional networks across the state. As a matter of fact, I know there are several of you on the call today. And uh, we work to coordinate localized efforts around professional development, capacity building, and advocacy as well. Uh, so if you are not familiar with our regional after school networks, check out our webpage and uh, you can be connected with them um, because uh, talking about bringing in partnerships, working collaboratively, thinking of ways to help each other's goals. This is a great opportunity for you to be in a space where you meet people who have like goals and like ideas, and maybe you could uh, work towards uh, collaborative efforts for collective impact. So I absolutely encourage you to check it out as well. Um, for those of you uh, who are interested in uh, get, getting staff, um, so depending on the kind of grant you're uh, applying for, you might be looking for style, we have our after school pathfinder, which is a free tool. You do not have to pay anything to be involved in that. And there's a free job list inside uh, for you to be able to recruit um, staff for your programs as well. And I know Jay talked about our Jedi series. Uh, so this is also available free of charge, focused on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, we look at a ton of different uh, uh, topics and themes and really a, a great way to uh, even bolster our equity efforts as well. 
Um, I do want to add, I know I'm running short on time, that uh, we also do advocacy and policy, and we have our advocacy days for after school coming up and for community schools as well in person at the state capitol in Albany. And so we will share all this information with you. Highly encourage you to also come to join because part of um, having funding available for you all is ensuring that uh, state legislators and decision makers are committed to increasing these funds so that we are able to um, uh, tap into those funds uh, to ensure high quality programs as well. Uh, next slide. I also wanted to talk about the uh, child and adult uh, care food program, which is a federal program that reimburses uh, eligible after school programs for nutritious snacks and uh, meals. Um, this is uh, something that really adds up. Um, and I, I think we put in, in here um, that if, for instance, you're serving 100 students uh, a snack and a meal of the day, uh, every day for a month, you could be reimbursed up to $10,000. So uh, if you've not heard of this at all, highly encourage you to check this out. Um, we put the link in the chat um, so that you can get some money back um, based on the work that you're already doing to help provide uh, support for our young people as well. And uh, I believe this was the last slide. Yes, thank you. <laughs> back to you, Jen. Trudy, thank you so much for sharing those great resources. We are at time, but uh, we've got a few minutes ourselves that we can linger. Um, if people would like to stay and pose questions, we can try and get to some of those for the next few minutes. Uh, for folks that do need to take off, we hope to see you back uh, on the 18th. We'll have two more experts uh, coming in, and we will also be continuing to schedule out this series based in large part on the feedback you offered today. Thank you for responding to that poll. Um, are there any questions that people wanna to bring to the front of the chat? I saw some of them come in earlier. Um, feel free just to type them right into chat. That would be the easiest, uh, I think, way for me to, uh, to scan for them. Jay, Karen has a question. It, are you able to unmute, Karen? Uh, yeah, I am. Actually, my question, and I put it in in the beginning of the chat, was um, we are primarily, uh, we primarily have uh, New York State and New York City grants. Um, so I'm looking for advice on how to move into the area of private and foundation grants. Um, I looked at Candid, and we're going to get registered on Candid, but I'm looking for any other advice that you might have on how to start getting into it. This is my first foray into grant writing, so I expect to be rejected a lot, but <laughs> um, any ideas you can give me, I'd appreciate it. Brett, let's kick that to you for private foundations. Sure. I mean, I think, I think unfortunately, it's just going to be a slow go of it. So what I would do is, and I don't know what organization you work for, but I would start looking at the annual reports of your sister organization. So any of them that provide similar types of services, um, as well as I think it also a little bit depends on exactly what you're looking for. So to use the Robin Hood Foundation as an example, they're a large funder. They give six and seven figure grants, but they're also incredibly intense, intense in depth and very data and metrics heavy. And they're harder to break into unless you have private and foundation kind of already existing. So you could think of them as like the next level up, so to speak. Um, whereas there are smaller foundations and there are smaller grant makers that are more geared towards organizations that are just starting the process. And so I think that depending on exactly what it is you're looking for, you might want to start with organization or like with smaller funders that are at like the 10 to 20, $25,000 level. And I don't know if that constitutes smaller, larger than your organization as kind of a starting point, because they're a little bit easier to get. They're not as data and metric and like compliance heavy, as well as also they will be a bit more accessible. And once you start to have those, then you can build upon and to try to get larger foundations. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, just cold emails, like kind of draft an email. Or, so when you identify some funders uh, who you think might be a fit is then go to their websites or you can just call them up and ask for their email addresses, but write up a, an email or two that kind of spells out who your organization is, like the services you provide. Don't make it too long, three to four paragraphs at the most. Otherwise people are just going to tune out. And um, don't also ask for funding in that, but also start off just like, I'd love to introduce our organization. So 
for example, if you're in Brooklyn, there's something called the Brooklyn Community Foundation where they invite nonprofits all the time to just email them and then they will set up a conversation with you just to introduce themselves in chat because they really focus on grassroots organizations. And so the smaller foundations are happy all the time to chat with you. It might not work at first, but if you can at least get in front of them and get them to know your name, from there they will then remember you and you may get rejected twice and that third time it turns into funding. As our executive director who recently retired always used to say, you know, a no is just a, a no is just waiting to become a yes, right? Like if you constantly keep banging on that door, eventually it will, it will get you through. And so I can't exactly, besides candid, I can't exactly point you to any hardcore resources other than if you just start looking at annual reports of your sister organizations, especially the larger ones, you'll just get lists upon lists of foundations. And then from there, just start researching them, finding your finding program officers, and then just emailing them introductions. And that's just, and it's just over time, you'll start to build up more of a network. So that would be my recommendation. Brad, part of what I'm hearing you say is that um, funders may say no, but they don't bite. Go ahead and stick your hand out and see what you can see what you can do. The worst you're going to get is a no. So give it a give it a go is part of what I'm hearing. How then, can, hold on, Jay. The only oh, other very quick thing, I'm sorry. The only very quick thing I'll say is always ask for a debriefing. I can give oh, it. Oh, okay. Very example. good. Yeah. Uh, there was a foundation that unfortunately the pandemic ruined and since had to close its doors. But prior to that, they had said no to us by our proposal. But I asked for a debriefing and the executive director met with me for a half hour and said what was wrong with our proposal and how to tailor it. And then the next funding round, I took her information and her insights, wrote another proposal and we got it funded because I tailored exactly to what she said. So always ask for a debriefing and the funders nine times out of 10 will happily tell you where you can strengthen it. So that's it. Can I just uh, really quickly, Karen, just in a nutshell, I just want to say the difference between um, if you've been doing government type or municipality type grants and foundation grants is the relationship. Um, where in government grants, it's pretty cut and dry. You answer their questions, you do a thorough job, you, you get your points, you get your grant. Uh, when it comes with foundations, it's all about building that, re that personal relationship. And I think that's what Brett has been talking about is really working on building that relationship between you and that foundation uh, because it is more cooperative, it is more uh, personal um, and it's less just answer the questions, submit the application. So there's a question, Holly, that I want to steer towards you as a school district, and I don't mean to put you on the hot seat here, but uh, Christina has asked, gosh, it seems like mm -hmm. the money went to the schools, and here we are with our high-quality, ready-to-go services. What do we do to access those ARP dollars that school districts may have? Do they, you know? So can you give any advice to a nonprofit that would want to knock on a school district's door? Right. So those the school districts do have those on lock and key, right? Like they they're they're the the gatekeepers to those up doll, um, ARP dollars for for the CBOs. So if you're interested in accessing the ARP funding the school districts are receiving, it's about again building that relationship. There's a lot of relationship building in the grants world one way or another, whether you're working with foundations in order to seek funding from them or you're building relationships with community partners, you'll notice my, my title is Director of Grants and District Community Programs. And there's a reason for that um, because those partnerships really, really matter. And you may have the best, most amazing program in the world, uh, but you have to do a couple things. One, you have to find the right person at the school district to talk to. And that can be really challenging and it will take some lead work. You can talk to some people, but if you don't get the right person at the school district, you're gonna get nowhere. Um, so really doing some work and asking good questions and trying to find out who that person is, looking at the website, who's the person you want to talk to, who's going to be able to help potentially open a door for you or get you in that door or set up a meeting or get a conversation going about, um, you know, partnership. Also be prepared to show evidence base. School districts must have evidence-based programs for almost all the funding that they receive. So if you have a program that has a good evidence base, um, you have a better shot of, of that program being accepted by the school district. Understand your district, understand who to talk to, um, and be prepared to sell your product. Um, and, and the school district will be more likely to, to consider partnering with you or giving you a contract. But um, unfortunately, um, it's going to take work on your part because those school districts do have that money, you know, lock and key, and they often have longstanding partnerships that they reuse over and over again. So it, it's, it is a, a bit of a lift, but because of the amount of money that does flow through school districts, it could be a very worthwhile, uh, good use of your time to build those relationships. So I just wanna chime in and add on to that. And I would say for me as a school district, one other thing I'm responsive to is when someone is caring about my kids. When you start that conversation with, we serve your students, 
and we'd like to work with you to offer better services for them. School districts, I think one key difference for me, we definitely worry about having funding for programming that we want to offer, but we're very unlikely to close our doors, right? We're a municipality, we're tax-based. Nonprofits have to work sometimes just to keep the lights on. And those are two different approaches. So there sometimes isn't the desperation or the sense of urgency for school districts. And that's important, I think, for nonprofits to keep in mind as they're approaching conversations around mission and vision and conversation around student outcomes, depending on your audience, may resonate more than even dollars and cents. Because sometimes the schools, it's not that we don't necessarily need dollars to do more, but sometimes that's not the starting point for us. So um, I just want to give one more second to see if any other questions are going to come into chat or if anyone wants to go off mute. I'm not I, I may have missed some earlier. Hi, hello. Hi, go ahead, Kayla. Hi, my name is Kala. Um, uh, sorry, Kala. Thank yes, you. For it's your... okay. <laughs> I'm so excited to be a part of this training today. Like I literally begged my boss to take this training um, because um, I really do see myself opening my own homeless shelter within the next one or three years. Um, do you think it's harder to get funding for homeless shelters because it's so much competition? Well, that's a very specific question. Um, Brett, what do you what do you think about general competition? And um, I've got a couple of thoughts on that, but I'd like you to lead off. Sure. So in full transparency, we being Good Shepherd Services, we're a member of supportive housing. We don't run homeless shelters. And so I can't speak specifically to that, like that issue or that content area. What I will say is two things. One is if that's something you're passionate about to do it, like just absolutely flat out, you should go for it and do it. But two, and this is a challenge that I know Mayor de Blasio of the city had tried to address. And I think Mayor Adams is also in some ways trying to address it, but what ends up happening a lot of times is that, especially from city funding, is that it's much more, it is geared towards the larger organizations that have a history and an ability to have done this for years. So if you look at some of the city RFPs, for example, what they will say is you have to demonstrate three years of the past five years in experience in providing this work, which precludes smaller organizations, and not smaller, startup organizations from kind of getting into the work. And so, again, I know that, I know that there was a real push to try to include grassroots organizations and newer organizations in the process. It hasn't gotten there yet. And so unfortunately, I think that may be a barrier of sorts that you will run into, again, from accessing city funding. I don't want to speak either towards homeless funding specifically, because we don't do that work, nor on a state level, because again, we don't do that work. So I don't have any um, like any ways to really gauge. But I will say, if it's something you're passionate about, to try to think of other ways to do it. So if you can get space through in-kind donation from somebody to provide that work, or if you can cobble together funding from either private sources or whatnot um, until you can get that experience. Because once you unlock city funding, it really does become easier to secure it. And so it's like that first hurdle you have to clear. And then after that, it is easier to get. So yes, unfortunately, I wish I had better news. You may run into challenges in the beginning, but once you can surmount those challenges, uh, it does become easier. So, Kyle, I'm now just going to. Uh, oh, go ahead. Follow up. Yep. When you when you say that it's going to be a barrier to, you said it's going to be a barrier to get sitting sit, city of uh, funds. Yes. Because so, they normally go towards the the uh, the companies that have been around for a very long time. So, and again, this is purely from New York City funding, so I can't speak to anything else outside of that, but there's two challenges from city funding that present a barrier, not insurmountable by any stretch, but a barrier that exists. One is that a lot of the RFPs mandate that you have a certain level of experience in providing the services before you, in order to apply. So we're looking right now at a funding opportunity for youth in the justice system. And as part of that, they want you to have at least three years of experience serving youth in the justice system. So that means, right, if you've never done that type of work, you you don't have that three-year minimum um, like experience in order to qualify for it. I have over five years. Okay. So then, so then if that's the case, then again, I would most certainly encourage you to apply because again, there's no harm in applying other than it will take up some of your time. So it's right. very possible. The city system a little bit is 
is geared more towards experienced nonprofits. But again, you should definitely give it a shot. You know, the only way to get that experience is to get that experience. And to, to chime into that, the other the other things that it sounds like you're going to know more about this than I will. Uh, but the a lot of times funding around housing really does tie right to to that safety can you provide the safety can you meet those regulations can you assure and and also it seems sometimes to me that it's very focused on a population so if you are for instance uh serving uh vets or serving youth or serving victims of abuse there might be very specific funds for types of people that need housing support um, or types of experiences that lend themselves to housing support. So those are great uh, questions. I got a couple that have popped up in direct message and chat I want to get to quickly. And thank you. Thank you. Um, one is uh, a pretty straightforward question. Are there any grant writing books that you recommend or any books in general? I honestly couldn't think of any. I was wondering if either of you two had a book that you read. There, I did look at Grant Writing for Dummies once. That seemed to yeah, fit. that was the one. I mean, that's the one that <laughs> is kind of the, the only one out there that I know of is Grant Writing for Dummies. I actually had the opportunity to meet the woman who wrote the book. She's pretty prolific. She's got a long history in grant writing. Um, but yeah, that's the one that I that I recommend. I think I actually direct messaged somebody who asked that question earlier. Grant <laughs> writing. Yeah. Brad, any books? I unfortunately don't have any recommendations. I have never read a book yeah. on grant writing. I just have kind of built the experience over the years. So. I think that the uh, a lot of times it's that just go do it advice and then get feedback. Um, another is, is there a good way to allocate the cost of a grant writer into the grant itself, like indirect services? And um, I, Holly, do you want to answer that one first and then Brad? Yeah, sure. And I did direct message that individual as well, but it's probably good for the whole group. So that's really an ethical gray area. In fact, I'm being generous by calling it an ethical gray area. It's fact, it's actually an ethical don't, right? Um, so typically the cost of a grant writer cannot be included in the budget of a grant that you apply for. Now that may be different for some uh, corporate or foundation grants, but again, that's not my bread and butter. Um, mine is government grants. And in government grants, it's just not a thing that's done. It's considered to be kind of unethical um, and to do that. Uh, just to be clear. Yeah, I mean, that's what indirect covers, right? A lot of the time is you cover your support systems. Um, and to Holly's point, I can think of one time when a foundation provided some support around our development staff, but unfortunately, it tends to not be an area that's covered. It tends to be that that has to be funded through some other mechanism. Yeah, so that could be your indirect or your general operating um, I will tell you that sometimes you can get, if you're somebody that is looking for a grant writer, um, if you've got a good one and somebody that's willing to bet on themselves, sometimes they will delay charging you um, until the grant is awarded. And then you, that might give your agency some, uh, some belief that they've got, you know, if, if there's some lights on money in the grant. And that creates a lift in the budget in other areas. And that started that braiding and blending funding. That's its, its whole other topic. And it can be done and it can be done well, uh, but it always has to be done with an eye on the criteria, the regulations, and the allowability in each grant. It's, uh, it's something to, to be careful with for sure. And I just uh, want to really quickly just say that as somebody who's worked in the private sector and, and, and run a grant development office, um, what you're paying for is not the award. You're paying for the work and the expertise of the person to write the grant application in the first place. And I think that's an important distinction. Whether or not you're awarded, the person has already completed the work and provided the service. And realistically speaking, if they've done their job well, which I'm hopefully you're hiring and, and paying a, a good grant writer, you have an application to resubmit another time, to tweak, to, to improve. Yes. Um, so you're really paying for that product that you can potentially resubmit indefinitely, right? Um, so just a good thing to remember. And that is a, an option too for folks as a uh, as a way to get started that we didn't mention is to to hire somebody. Um, if you're a school district, BOCES sometimes has that service available through a COSER. Um, if you are a nonprofit, you might be able to partner with the school district, and they might be able to get um, a, a, a BOCES COSER service, which can result in some aid. But I do think that. Holly's point is well taken that you will have a deliverable that you can use as a template, 
Uh, and this was one last question. This will be our last question is, okay, I've taken the plunge. I've started to write these grants. Can I see some examples of well-written grants? How can I find some grants that have been written well? Where, how do I even, how can I even measure, is there something I can measure myself against? And that'll be our last question uh, for the call. Uh, either of you want to answer that one? I can speak to that and um, briefly. So um, first of all, let's just put out there that grant applications are FOILable. So Freedom of Information, FOIA, FOIL, Freedom of Information Act, you can actually request to see any grant application that's been submitted at least into a government agency, right? Um, another way, to, a good way to go about taking a look at those applications is if you know of a grant program that you're interested in potentially applying for or one similar, that has similar programs, similar deliverables, similar measures, you can go on, search and see who the most recent award list is, like who recently received those awards. And then you can um, contact them and ask for a, a copy of their, um, their application. And you can even do a FOIL request. So that might be a good way to get some, some information about award-winning grants that are in the same you know, area that, um, that you are interested in applying for. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would add to that is I definitely know some public I can definitely think specifically of the federal federal community schools grant a couple of years ago. They also released the proposals of the winning applicants. Um, so I know that I read one of them because it was from the city and it was very interesting to read how they framed it. But a lot of times public agencies will also, again, release the applications of the winners. So. So I really want to thank everybody. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Lorraine's got a question about funding for gardens. I put a couple of hints in there, Lorraine. Home Depot and Lowe's are good garden writing grants um they'll they'll give donations but I, that's a great example of a very specific ask where you've got all kinds of in-kind services wrapped around and i'm willing to bet that you can find uh somebody that can help you uh with that for sure and i think that i'm seeing oh yep farm to school edible garden turnkey grants so a google search um but if you have some look at look at the uh if you have any box stores around you or any hardware stores or anything like that, really good place to uh, really good place to look. And there's another grant from Allie in the uh, in the chat. Thank you, everybody, so much. We are gonna um, uh, bring this session to a close, and really very very glad to have all of you stay on, and so many of you stay on past the projected end time of one o'clock. Um, really appreciate your contributions to this time and hope you'll join us as we continue to discuss uh, sustainability and developing funding streams for quality programming. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.